Now, I watch a lot of reactors. As people who watch me very much on this uh, show know, I watch a lot of reactors, people who watch TV and videos and stuff like that and will react to them. Uh, I got into this in large measure because I discovered that there are millennial... Yeah, incredible wandering interview. Marcellus. I discovered there are uh, a lot of millennials, post-millennials, who have never seen movies that you know I grew up with and that are today considered classics. The ones that blow me away, and there are lots of them out there, are the ones that have never seen any Star Wars movie before. I cannot imagine that because it's like Superman and Batman. It's part of the American public lexicon. You know, if you you know all these memes, you've seen all this stuff. There are all these sayings with relating to Star Wars, yet you've never seen it. Um, so I got into watching them to some extent for that, and partly because it's a psychological thing for me having to do uh, with, uh, you know, the age and gender of them tend to be uh, surrogates for my children at certain points, so it's kind of fun to think about, okay, this is what it would be like if I was watching it with them. But the ones that I really am interested in right now, and there is almost nobody doing it, I would be very, very interested if more millennials, more post-millennials, would watch Star Trek, the original series. Because I kind of get it. I get it. It's, it's a tough watch. Not because the stories are bad. They're usually very good. Um, certainly, Star Trek has a very good hit-and-miss ratio. But because we are now more removed in time and have been for some time, from Star Trek, the original series, to now than we were from the 1930s, 1940s Flash Gordon serials to when I first saw them in probably the 1970s. We are farther removed in time and farther removed in technology. It's just, you know, it's a totally different world. Um, and a lot of the times it will drag them out of the moment. They'll be watching the show and they'll see what you see behind me. You know, flashing lights and buttons and switches and knobs and things that they just can't comprehend now. You know, it looks fake and phony to them. Uh, it isn't helped by the fact that, you know, we've now got Blu-rays, and, you know, this was a, a show that was meant to be shown on uh, analog, crappy analog broadcast television that was that never had a very clear screen to begin with. You're seeing me in 60 frames, in 1080p at 60 frames per second. And then, you know, at the time of Star Trek, the next generation, something like that, I mean, Star Trek, the original series, something like that was never even on anyone's radar. And if it had been, no doubt they would have, if they'd ever thought that this was going to be seen this many years later with this kind of resolution, they would have done things very differently. Um, you would still get some of the same problems. Science fiction never, ever, ever predicts the future correctly. It always gets it wrong. No exceptions. But the big conceit at the time that Star Trek, the, the original series, was going on was that we would have their projection was, and it was nobody stupid thinking about this. A lot of people thought this. Isaac Asimov, one of the you know, best and most prolific science fiction authors out there, they assumed that we would have a massive gener leap in generation of power, that nuclear power would re lead to other massive generations in power. And what we actually got was massive revolutions in information technology. So while this seemed perfectly reasonable to somebody who, for whom a computer was the size of a small warehouse, you know, uh, it was not what we got. And the, the massive amount of power that they thought we were going to get was not what we got. So for people w now watching this, it's tough. I get it. I can't pay my kids to watch Star Trek, the original series. So there are a pair of reactors on uh, YouTube, um, the Gallifrey Gals, which consist of uh, Paula Deming and uh, Katrina Alicia. I know, having looked, that Paula Deming is at least uh, an actress. I, may, I didn't do it, but I'll put a link to their YouTube channel below. And they're going through, they're getting to, they've been reacting to Doctor Who, the new Doctor Who. And they're getting to the point where they're almost to the day of the Doctor, the best Doctor Who episode ever made, period. And so in honor of that, they're going back and they're watching um, some uh, original classic Who. And for some reason, I don't know why, they watched The City on the Edge of Forever from Star Trek, the original series. Now, for people who are younger, uh, if you want to watch an episode of Star Trek, the original series, 
City on the Edge of Forever is one of the best ones you can watch because it doesn't have a lot of this. There is some in the beginning, the first 15 minutes, you get some of this. And uh, Alien Planet-wise, yeah, you get stuff that today looks like a set, you know, in 1080p and <laughs> Blu-ray. It looks like a set. But the moment after that, it turns into a period piece in, 19, in the 1930s, right? And the thing about a period piece is that doesn't age very much. You know, New York City in 1930, if you do it right with the right costumes and, you know, all of that, it's going to look like New York City in the 1930s, even if you watch it 100 years from now. You know, the technology of getting you this may have changed, but it's still going to look like the 1930s. So if you're going to watch Star Trek, the original series, it's A, a good one for that, because it won't drag you out of the moment as much. But B, it is, in my opinion, and the opinion of many people who have watched all of Star Trek, uh, the franchise, it is, in my opinion, the best Star Trek episode ever written. Um, this is partly because the brain behind it, the original brainchild, was Harlan Ellison, uh, one of the best writers ever, period. Um, there's a lot of backstory about how that episode got made. And long and the short of it is, all of the shenanigans that went on behind the scenes caused Harlan Ellison to hate Gene Roddenberry's guts, not just until Roddenberry died, but until Ellison himself died. You know, he just hated his guts. And... Um, I won't go into all of the stuff that went into that because it gets very complex. There's a really good book about it. I've forgotten the name. I will look it up and put it in the description box. But there's a very good book that Harlan Ellison wrote about it that includes multiple drafts of the script so you can kind of see, okay, this is how it evolved and who wound up getting their hands on it and all that. Harlan Ellison was very pissed about it because you don't change Harlan Ellison's words. For him, his words are God. He thought he was going to have the ability to change all, to make all the revisions. He ultimately didn't and hated Gene Roddenberry for the literally the rest of Ellison's life. He hated Roddenberry. But all of that aside, it is still a great episode for me. It encapsulates virtually everything about Star Trek. It is uh, showing us and even talking, practically talking directly to the audience in one of the scenes that must have had Gene Roddenberry's hands on it. It sounds just like his preachiness. But preaching about a better future, while at the same time having the drama be about very difficult decisions that have to be made under the circumstances they're in. That's just quintessentially Star Trek. And so if you're going to watch Star Trek, the original series, Paula and Katrina chose a really good one to watch. Paula and Katrina. I did a pause at the beginning of this in the live stream because I am going to pull this out as a clip. Your reaction afterwards was good in terms of what you talked about and clearly how you reacted to the episode is basically the way everybody always reacts to it. It's just a great episode. But Katrina, you said something that I think is because you're young and you lack the uh, experience to know the difference. Uh, Katrina had opined, you know, that it was really great. We're seeing, you know, in much of Star Trek, we see, you know, predicting a bright future, a hopeful future. And then she went back and she says, it's almost, you know, it's really angering that we've gone back and done the same things. Katrina, we have not. This is, this is the message I want to give to you. We have not gone back and done the same things. The problem is you have been raised as a millennial, post-millennial, I can't tell which, I can't tell anymore what people's kids' ages are. You have been raised in a culture that is artificially nihilistic. You have been raised in the culture in which decapitated baby heads, um, on-screen graphic uh, torture is normal. You've been raised in a culture in which the press has gone and made a gigantic deal out of very small problems like racism, like white supremacy, like Nazism. They say all of these things are really big problems. And I have to tell you, as somebody who lived from this time period, my first memory is the Mugatu from A Private Little War from Star Trek in 1967. It's original airing on TV. Things have gotten much, much better. You know, when you look at wars, 
World War II. I don't even remember what the total is, but I mean, probably 100 million people died in that war, you know, civilians and soldiers alike. About 100 million, something like that. I'd have to get the exact figure. We have not had a war like that ever since. If you were to look at kind of a graph and how wars had gotten more and more costly in terms of you know people dying, it's this giant peak in World War II and then down to nothing. Now, even if you look at wars like Iraq, you know the most recent ones, or Afghanistan, or if you look even at Vietnam, we have not seen a war on that scale. We have not seen death on that scale ever since. You know, that huge amount of people lost in World War II is so now ingrained, I think, in the human consciousness that it's something that we are not going to see again, at least not anytime soon. I don't know what conditions you could set up where the entire world would be at war and willing to kill that many people. And so when you look at war, it's gone way down. We've had a little bumps up and down here, but nothing. You know, this is World War II. And after that, phew, you know, little bumps here, but nothing like World War II. In terms of warfare, we are becoming far more civilized. And there's every reason to think that it's going to get better. When we look at things like racism, okay, you have been sold a bill of goods. Racism in the 1960s was being able to say the N-word routinely. You know, until the 1970s, even the mid-1970s, when I was growing up, and I went to a very exclusive um, prep school because my mother taught there, so we got free tuition, my sister and I. But I went to this very expensive prep school. And even then, the one black guy who was in our class was constantly referred to by the N-word. Now, very shortly after that, within a couple of three years, it was just verboten. We, nobody spoke it ever again. I don't know anyone who has spoken that word in decades. Surely there are people, no doubt, there are people who do it. But most people do not speak that word. In terms of, you know, the racism back then in the 1960s, there were still places where, where segregated water fountains were, you know. Some white people actually believed that black people were inferior and d disease carrying. I mean, that, l that really happened in my lifetime. I remember it. I'm very young, but I remember that. You know, when we look at today's racism, do we still have it? Yes. But was it anything like then? No, nothing like it. For race relations, for the most part, modern times are the best time to be any kind of racial minority in the United States. Absolutely. And this has not changed. This is a trend that has been going on. If you look at the number of people, you can't pay attention to the press. They're always giving you false information. In particularly when Trump was in office, they were always giving false information because they wanted to get him the hell out of office. And I speak to you as a libertarian. I did not really care. that To me, Trump was just the 10th president of my lifetime. I did not see all that much difference about him, but the press hated his guts. And so they said, oh, we have all this racism and stuff exploding under him. No, we didn't. If you look at, you know, and I know, my city of Lincoln, Nebraska was once the home of the American Nazi Party, the headquarters of the American Nazi Party. And it was a joke by then because the headquarters of the American Nazi Party, I used to walk past it on my way to school from time to time, it was a broken down ramshackle POS house. And the president or head of the American Nazi Party was this old geezer who in his basement was churning out hate literature to a tiny number of people and ever decreasing. If you actually see a real Nazi Party rally, there's maybe a dozen or so people in their stupid little parade. It has been decreasing over my entire life. The number of people now who are actual racists compared to when Star Trek, the original series, was on is very small in the United States. Very, very small. You want to get racist, go to China, right? They hate black people in general. That's real racism. We have seen it decreasing over my lifetime. There's every reason to believe that it's going to get better and better. And black people 
in the 1960s were just being able to move into things like doctors, lawyers, engineers. They it was just impossible. You know, it was just impossible. Today, it's very possible. You know, if you had the capability, you can go on. If you're smart, if you can do those things, you can go on. How many, how many black, Asian, etc. My current MD, my current GP, is an East Indian woman. Clearly, we don't have that kind of racism right now. It has gotten much, much better, and there's every reason to believe that it's going to continue to get much better. Drugs which, Katrina, I know you've spoken about in your videos. Drugs are still a problem, but they always will be as long as we continue to have prohibition. The problem with drugs, the real problem is the prohibition because it creates gang warfare, it drives the price up, and it makes it much more difficult to get somebody the treatment that they need. You have to get government out of the equation. And so things have the type of drugs, the amount of drugs, the uh, way the drugs have been refined and all that has gotten much better ref refined and stuff like that in modern times compared to the 1960s. But the problem still remains. But if you got government the hell out of it, that would largely disappear as well. You know, the, the, the drug abuse problems that you've talked about with people in your own life. It would be something where it's limited not to uh, all of the illegal stuff going on. It's just how do we get them the help that they need, you know, so that they can get sober, you know. And technology, for God's sake, you know, when I was born and when I when Star Trek was on, the computers that were in behind all of this stuff that you see behind me, they really thought were going to be the size of about four decks in the center of the, you know, big giant computer core inside the, you know, the center part of the Sausen section in the Enterprise. Now, hell, any one of these stations would be your phone, you know. Computers used to be gigantic. Now they're tiny. They're going to get tinier even still. We are on the cusp of solving world hunger with 3D printing. We are on the cusp, essentially, of changing what it means to be human because of advancements in technology. And we just got off. Uh, I'm, as I say, I'm pulling this out a clip to aim specifically at them because they would never see a comment of mine. When you look at the entirety of what we just talked about in my live stream, we're looking at a massive shift in finance that's going to change the world. You are headed into, you are right now, in a time period that is better in the Western society than has ever been in the past. Women, women, for God's sake, women. On Star Trek, the original series, having Lieutenant Uhura on the bridge, a female black officer, was a damn big thing. At that time, did you have black officers? Uh, probably there were a few. Most of them would be enlisted men, and sometimes they were mistreated, you know. Um, it, Black people did things like they were porters, you know, uh, for trains and things like that. They were really relegated to the back of the bus, even though they had, for close better part of a century, had equal rights under the Constitution. There's still all this discrimination. And a black woman, you know, that's a double threat because women at that time, on both sides, the end of the 1960s is where it started to change, but it didn't really change much until the 1980s. You know, I, I have stories from people in my industry, IT, you know, women who are older than I am, who have talked about how hard it was to get into IT because they were female. Today, at least 50% of the workforce in IT is female, if not more, if not more. Um, you know, so that has all changed. And a black female officer. I'm sure they had female officers. And I'm, and I'm talking about an officer. I mean, somebody who would have had the training to be uh, the leadership positions and stuff like that to make the big calls. Not, you know, the listed people, not non-commissioned officers, but in this case, ensign, lieutenant, junior grade, lieutenant, lieutenant commander, commander, captain, admirals, etc. Having a lieutenant, the third grade up as an officer in, in that grade. You have ensign, you have lieutenant junior grade, and lieutenant. Three grades up, right? That was a big freaking deal. You know, having a female black officer 
shown on television. Despite the fact she never really got a hell of a lot to do. But that was a big thing, such that when Nichelle Nichols was thinking about leaving the show, Dr. Martin Luther King himself said, no, you don't either. You know, you got to stay there. Showing a black female officer is a huge deal. And at least one astronaut whose name escapes me was, in fact, inspired by Lieutenant Uhura being there. You know, that was very forward thinking and something that was impossible in the 1960s and is totally possible today. And getting better all the time. Yeah, there we are headed into an optimistic future. We don't frack it up, which is entirely possible. We can frack it up. But if we don't, we are still headed into a very bright future. The nihilism that you guys see and experience in your entertainment is artificial. Now, I always like to say my late great acting guru, Dr. William Morgan, once said, theater is planned, rehearsed spontaneity. So when you see something on television, when you see decapitated baby heads in Star Trek Discovery, when you see beheadings in Star Trek uh, Picard, when you see Ichab getting his eyeball ripped out graphically on TV, this is all planned, rehearsed spontaneity. It's not real. That stuff's not going on in the, in the first world. In the Western world, that's not happening. When it happens, it is extraordinarily rare. This is planned, rehearsed spontaneity. And similarly, when you get into the press, scrolls by on my lower third every single time. Nothing you see in the press is real. And I know this because for 41 years, I have engaged in a very masochistic hobby of debunking every press story that I've ever seen. You guys can feel free. My other viewers can feel free. You can give me any press story that you like. and I will live here on the stream debunk it cold. I'll walk through and I'll show you how it isn't real. It is planned, rehearsed. Spontaneity is all theater. In real life, things are much, much better than you can possibly imagine. What we're fed is totally wrong. What you are fed is not accurate. We are not in the same position in the 1960s as we were then. We are completely different. It is a much, much better world now. And we, if we don't frack it up, we're going to get to a much better world still. So, you know, when you think about that stuff, what Star Trek was saying then turned out to be accurate. You know, we didn't kill ourselves in the Cold War. We could have, but we didn't. Kirk once said that we faced at, at some point in the past a, a, a crisis where we could have killed each other. But we found the wisdom to overcome that. And that's what happened. If we don't frack it up, if we find the wisdom, then we are headed in an extremely, extremely bright future. We have a bright future from when Star Trek, the original series, was on. So keep that in mind. You know, when you're watching this, don't get upset. Things have changed dramatically from then to here, and it's going to change dramatically from here to when you die. Uh, looking at my uh, comments here on the YouTube side, um, let's see. TDG is saying, first world issues uh, Mae Jemison. Yes, Mae Jemison was the astronaut who was inspired by Lieutenant Uhura, who was told by Martin Luther King that as a black female officer, even if she just sat there and said, hailing frequencies open, sir, meant that they were showing something for black people that was totally revolutionary. Nobody was doing that back then. And yet today, it's a reality. You know, you couldn't have a female, I mean, Mae Jameson, black female officer and an astronaut, for God's sake. We have gone into a very, very bright world. And you just have to know that all this stuff that you've been fed is nonsense. It's just nonsense. Yes, um, Marshall says, uh, we still have to get to we're not going to kill today. There's a great line in Star Trek, the original series, in an episode that you should watch. Um, God, the name of which escapes me. But Kirk says that the first step in doing any of this is we have to say to ourselves, yes, we can be savages, but we're not going to kill today. 
And, you know, to some extent, we have gotten to that, Marshall. I mean, again, if you look at the sheer number of casualties in World War II versus what we have now, you know, uh, it's not that it isn't without its problems. It certainly is. But we are in a much better world than you can possibly imagine, Paula and Katrina. We are in a much better world. And I can only tell you this by virtue of having lived through some of the bad parts, um, having lived through, you know, the threat of death by nuclear fire for the first half or more of my adult life. You don't have to worry about that. We are likely not going to have a nuclear war. And certainly if we do use nuclear weapons in some kind of conflict, it's not going to destroy the world like it did. We don't have thousands of nukes, two countries pointed at each other, that if used would make the planet uninhabitable humans. Taste for Armageddon, um, Marshall is saying, yes, we are, we're not going to kill today is in Taste of Armageddon. A great line, by the way. To me, sums up what Roddenberry thought, you know, in terms of Star Trek. Yes, we have our flaws, but we're going to say, no, we're not going to kill today. So that's, that's basically what I have to say to uh, Paula, Deming, and Katrina, um, uh, Alicia. I, you know, when you look at this, and you look at Star Trek, the original series, and you say, God, they were writing all of this hopeful future that never came true. No, trust me, a lot of it has come true. A lot of it has come true. Not everything, but a lot of it has, in fact, come true. And what you're being fed, what you're being told by your nihilistic culture, by your nihilistic lying press, isn't true. In the first world, we don't have those problems. Yeah, you can get off the second and third world where it's horrible. But here in the first world, in the Western society, things are better now than they have ever been at any point in the, uh, in the past. It's, it's a better world right now. And if we don't frack it up, which we can, it's still going to get better. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds. <laughs>